and welcome to the Wormhole Podcast, episode 77, bringing on an author and talking with them in detail about one, occasionally more, of their books. I'm Charlie Place, and today I am joined by Jenny Keir. We'll be talking today about her latest published novel, The Legacy of Hailsham Hall, wherein Phoebe travels to the house to attempt to get revenge on her uncle Sidney, who threw her father out without a penny to his name. Sidney had won a weird and twisted treasure hunt their father set his sons. We also get Sidney's narrative from his younger years, wherein his mother disappeared and his malicious father, in revenge for her disappearance, set about making the hall into a big malign puzzle house of its own to punish everybody, particularly the women in the household, for their evil deeds, of which there are, of course, none. There are twists in this book and we will be discussing them. Without further ado, hello Jenny! Hey Charlie, thank you so much for inviting me on. I've been looking forward to it and your book was great. I'm going to have to ask, start us off, what was the reason you wanted to tell this particular story? The inspiration for this story was doing some research for big houses and looking at various architectural features because I'd had to learn a lot about architecture from my previous book. That was The Secrets of Hawthorne Place. And I got very involved in architecture and how this became characters in my books in their own right. And so the setting was as important as the people that lived in it to me. And I was going down the research rabbit holes that you do. And I came across the Winchester Mystery House, as it's known, which is a house in California in America. And... One of the weird things about this house is not only is it quite a hodgepodge, it's got turrets and lots of uh, stories to it, bits added on, but also it has numerous staircases, some of which lead nowhere. Now, to an author, this is fantastic. Why would you build a staircase that doesn't lead anywhere? It just doesn't make sense. So my writer brain was, well, what could be at the top of a staircase? Why would you build a staircase that leads nowhere? And although... Hailsham Hall is nothing like the Winchester Mystery House. That's where the inspiration came from. So I think the house came first and then all the puzzles. And you can immediately see if you've got a puzzle about where does the staircase lead, it leads to more puzzles. What else could I have in this house that would be mysterious, that would be inexplicable? And then from that came the Bellingham Board Games Company. And from that came the characters. So it wasn't a story, and sometimes it is, sometimes it's a story I want to tell, but in this particular instance, it evolved that way. So it evolved from the house to the puzzles, then who might live in the house, and then telling that story in the George timeline that I did afterwards. Blimey. I, <laughs> yeah, wow. I, I thought the house might have come a bit later, but I thought maybe the board games first, maybe the characters. So, I mean... Can you tell us more about the house that you created and also the setting and stuff? So it's set in a fictional town in Suffolk called Hailsham. And that came about because I was looking for a place that sounded like it would be in Suffolk, but isn't. Because I'm a big fan of inventing the uh, towns and villages that I write about. Because for me, that gives me greater artistic license so I don't have to be confined with what is actually in a village or a town I don't have to have their church their layout you know but I want people to have a sense of place that's really important so I'll often set it somewhere I know like Dorset or in this case Suffolk and I will reference real places so this is somewhere set on the Norfolk Suffolk border so it does talk about Norwich it does talk about Ipswich in the story and people they know these places and they know what the countryside around here might look like for example but it was really important to me that Helsham was completely fictional I wanted like I say the house to be quirky and different I just let my imagination go with this because why not and also because I'm not a planner although I am getting better I think Some of those fixtures and fittings within the house came as the story evolved. So a lot of them, I'm writing the story, I've got my characters now, and then I suddenly thought of things like, oh, how quirky to have distorted mirrors. You know, I'm looking for things that Clement Bellingham, who is the person that designed the house, would have put in to 
amuse himself because he's not a very nice character. In fact, he is the only character I think I have ever written in any of my novels that has absolutely no redeeming creature. There's nothing nice about him. And he's abusive to his wife, but he's also a creative genius. There's something not quite right about him. You know, he's he's got a twisted mind, a twisted way of thinking. And whilst this is fantastic when you're creating board games and you're thinking of puzzles and how can you trap people in a game-playing environment, it's not very nice in a real-life environment. And this man is not a very nice person. And he projects these things onto the house. So we find out that he doesn't particularly like women for various reasons in the story and is very unkind when he redesigns the house to the female members of staff doing things like making cupboards difficult to open, staircases uneven. He wants to make the lives of the women in this house difficult. And like I say, really the only time I've ever created a character that had not one single redeeming feature about him. Well, that's fascinating. I'm going to have to ask about that. So, I mean, why create a character with no redeeming features? You know, you're so used to creating characters who do and who are good as well. I can't answer that, honestly. He came to me. I didn't create him. He was always kind of there, whereas some characters, you have to work quite hard at getting them right and giving them characteristics that play into the story you have to craft the character and quite often again not being a planner I will create a character and then go ha- have to go back and tweak them because I will realize there is an aspect of their character that I have got wrong or there's an aspect of their character that I want to add and so I'm quite used to my character evolving with the story and he was just never like that he was always there I can't answer why he just was always there like that like a malevolent presence <laughs> hanging over the hall maybe because it's a sort of light gothic novel maybe that that dark presence was needed and I didn't want him to have any redeeming features he's not a nice person but it is unusual I I think it gives a well-rounded character if you can see that you know there's good and bad in everyone let's again not have perfect protagonists it doesn't work there is nobody out there who is perfect and lovable and you know had no faults And I think that's really important in antagonistic characters as well. But Clement just was always not very pleasant. And like I say, he came to me fully formed. So that is that was him. He knocked on the door and I let him in. Goodness. Well, I mean, you definitely gave him a a nasty run for his money, I suppose you could say. But um, you saying about Gothic, I'm going to bring this in now. It occurred to me that Sylvia is kind of like a nice, maybe a not dead, as you find out later whether she is or not, uh, Rebecca character. And then I was surprised actually to find that you had a TikTok video about Rebecca Daphne du Maurier. Was this an influence? Oh, absolutely. And there's been no secret about that. I mean, that, that was a book I loved as a teenager. And it was definitely a massive influence behind writing this book. The story is not the same. I think there's an element of what happened to Sylvia as there is of what happened to Rebecca. But again, my story is completely different because we do find out she isn't dead. And those hints of, is there a ghost? You know, the temperature in that staircase, Sydney feels like the temperature has dropped and, you know, maybe his mother's talking to him. There's there's those whispers of, is there a ghostly presence? I also quite deliberately created the folly which plays a huge part in the story, to be quite an eerie place. It was deliberately built very soon after she went missing because what I'm trying to do is get the reader thinking, could there be a body in the folly? You know, is that why he did it? Was this done in such haste because he wanted to conceal her body? And it becomes like a shrine to her. It's actually the only place in the story where her name is. It's written in the stained glass window. It's the only place where there's sort of any trace of her And we do find out that Clement goes to the folly and sort of almost talks to her. You know, that's the only place he will allow himself to connect with her because he has just wiped her out of his life for what he considers are her misdeeds, i.e. running away. And so, yes, that ghostly element was there. But unlike Rebecca, that is not the story I'm telling, but definitely a massive influence in, I think, the tone of the novel more than anything else. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. It's important that Sylvia remains alive at the end, isn't it? It was, yes. And I almost could write her story. I loved what happened to her. I loved that she went off and had her happy ending. And in my head, I could tell you all the details about that time period when she was absent. I could tell you all about it, but I don't write it in my story. I choose not to write it in my story because that is a whole other story that I could, but will not be telling. But it then, because I know that so well, it helps me when I'm writing Sydney and Phoebe's story that I do know the truth of what's happened. So I think we were talking about why do we not find out what happened to Phoebe's father, as in who Phoebe's father actually was. And we never find that out in the books. And again, I can tell you what he looks like. I can picture him. I know who he was. I know he was a member of the clergy. I know he was somebody that her father trusted. But it's not necessary in the story. If I fed that in, it would be an info dump. It's not needed. It might leave the reader questioning, who was Phoebe's father? But you don't actually need to know. It's not relevant to the story. Fair enough, fair enough. I mean, I thought with Phoebe, I will confess to getting a bit confused when there was talk, Ada was talking about Christopher. And then, of course, you have Sylvia later who has gone to Canada with Christopher. So, of course, I started thinking, not knowing about Sylvia, ah, it's Christopher, the father. Um, And then when, of course, it's revealed, you're like, okay, you know, he's not, obviously. But I suppose that's what makes me wonder about her father. But also, at the same time, you are absolutely right. You do not need to know. You know, that's that's not important to the story. No. And I think, as a reader, I get a little bit frustrated if everything is tied up too neatly. It's a balance, isn't it? Because I do not want my reading material to reflect real life because real life is tragic and it's not all neatly tied up in a bow. But you do need certain things. There's certain expectations of the genre. If it's a romance, you expect it to have a happy for now ending. It's a balance between being realistic and giving your reader what they want. So, yeah, I like to leave a few little things. And I also put a lot of tiny little clues in the book that I am almost certain readers do not notice, but they're almost there for my own satisfaction. So it's things like drip feeding that Douglas was a rumen. I did that very, very subtly in just a couple of places leading up to the fact that we turn that it turns out that he's not the guy we think he is. So much so that my editor had missed them. <laughs> and said, well, can we not have some clues that he's a bit, you know, dodgy? And I thought, well, they're there. And they were perhaps too subtle and perhaps I did have to tweak them a little bit. But it is all in that making it a rich book, even if not everything was picked up by everybody. I still think that's important. And I work very hard to do that. And that includes your, your red herrings as well. That includes leading readers down a blind alley. Fascinating. On Douglas then, and I'm going to go back to the board games because I know we've kind of skipped that at the moment. You've got Douglas and I thought for a while he might be good and I was excited to see if he would be good because I think that that could have been interesting if he was. But on Douglas, I suppose, and Sydney together, was wondering, was Phoebe always going to get with Sydney? Because I, you know, I did wonder if she might get with Douglas and have like a revengeful life living in the house and stuff. Oh, that would have been lovely too. Yeah. Perhaps that's another book I need to write with different characters. But uh, yes, I'm not a planner, like I said. But yes, there's certain things I do know when I start out with a book. And I always do know the bare bones of my story. So I had in my mind, I think, that I wanted a relationship in this book that had a large age gap and a relationship that you might think at the beginning couldn't possibly happen but that I could really pull the rug out from under your feet because you would assume the relationship between those two would make that not feasible, obviously, uncle and niece, but then to find out that she's not related to him. So, yes, I think that was my my thinking from the beginning as I, I want to surprise the reader with this romance. I don't want it to be obvious. I mean, part of the joy of the romance genre is that quite often you know the outcome and very quickly in most romance novels you know that she is going to end up with that particular character usually because they really annoy each other (laughs) or there's some kind of 
tension or conflict there, and that's absolutely right. But in this particular book, I deliberately set out to make the love interest not obvious from the beginning. That was part of my aim. Gosh, that's really fascinating to hear you say that. I mean, it's kind of like you are a reader of your own book. You know exactly what people are going to be wondering and stuff like that, which is really interesting to hear. So, I mean, I'm going to ask, why did you want the relationship as it was? Why the age gap, etc.? I think as, as it evolved, the age gap was necessary because I couldn't tell those two stories. But the age gap was also, you'll notice, the smallest I could get away with, <laughs> with them being possibly uncle and niece. There's 16 years between them. And that's one of the reasons there is such a big age gap between Leonard and Sydney. There had to be for me to write that story. It just led to so many other wonderful things that I hadn't thought about when I when I started writing it, in that actually when you've got such a big age gap between two brothers, they were almost like only children because by the time Sydney was, you know, walking and talking, Leonard was a teenager and you're not going to have that same sort of sibling relationship. And so out of that large age gap came really exciting things in the story. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, OK, I suppose a, a low stakes question, but here we go. Was Sydney or Leonard in your head first? Sydney. Yeah. Always. Always Sydney. And I actually came across a picture when I was doing research from the time period and I thought that's Sydney. And I won't show anyone that because I don't like it as a reader again. I don't like it when authors tell me what they think they're main characters look like and quite often we get asked you know if your book was going to be made into a film who would you cast as xyz and i'm always really disappointed with the answers that the authors give because that's not what i've got in my head and so i don't share that with people because you will have a different picture of sydney to me and that's fine if it gets made into a film then we'll wrestle it out then but <laughs> until then my sydney I'd carried around with me for probably two or three years now. And he was just a photograph on a, um, like a 1920s website. And I thought, yes, that's Sydney. And that really helped me, I think, to visualise him. It helped me to write him. Oh, interesting. I mean, if you have a film, I suppose you can get an act, a different actor for each scene, maybe, you know, just kind of mix it <laughs> up a bit. So, OK, we'll, we'll go back a bit. The board game company, you've introduced it a bit. Is it based on other companies at all? Where was the specific inspiration for that, I suppose? Okay, so yeah, I looked a lot into Waddington's and Parker Brothers and the key obviously there being that they were brothers. So that again, fed into my book. So yes, I looked a lot. I actually purchased some old fashioned games and I've got a lovely illustrated book of board games from the period, which I was highly amused to find, had a game called something like Escape to Mars with what people in the 1920s thought Martians looked like, which was just brilliant. And I had so much fun inventing the games in there because most of those I made up, which was just brilliant fun. And it was never going to be the Bellingham Board Game Company. It was just going to be that Clement Bellingham set these puzzles in his house until I was talking to a fellow author about the book and the stages it was in. And she said, oh, yes, because he could own a board game company. And it was a real kind of boat moment because I thought, well, why didn't I think of that? Of course, that's the obvious path to go down. Things that other people have said to me have sparked brilliant ideas that have led my books in directions I would not have gone down by myself. And also I was talking to my agent in a very early draft of the book and saying I was going to have these riddles that would need to be solved. So I was thinking verbal riddles, that they would just take them from one place to another. And she said, she, I think she kind of, not misunderstood, but she was sort of like swept up in the idea and said, oh, brilliant, because then the house itself is like a puzzle. And I thought, I've got to go back and rewrite. I've got to go back and rewrite that all and make the house the puzzle. Because what she said is genius. And it's much better than what I had before. And I'm quite happy to do that. I'll go back and rewrite. I'm not precious about it. If someone gives me a better idea or steers me in a clearer direction, 
or even warns me off something, you know, says, oh, I don't know if that's something you're qualified to write. I'll go back and rewrite. Why not? There's a fair amount to be said for a certain amount of collaboration. Yes, but I, equally, I know authors that can't do that because for them, it has to be just them until it's reached a point where they feel they can share it with their agent or their editor because it would maybe stop their own creative input. It's different for everybody and that is absolutely fine. Mm-hmm. And yes, I had wondered why board games themselves. And yeah, hearing that you hadn't had that at the start is very interesting because it does seem like such a crucial part of the book now. How much of the bad things that happened to Sydney in his life would you say are a result of his choices compared to things happening to him, if that's a question I can ask? I think it's a bit of both. I mean, the tragedy of Sydney's life is that he was never loved, I, I don't think. He, he was loved by his mother, but she disappeared when he was six years old. And can you imagine how that would affect a child And I think he spent the rest of his life looking for love and acceptance. And there was no one there. His father wasn't capable of that sort of love. He had Mrs. Murray in his life, who was an incredible figure throughout his life and throughout the story. But she was staff and there was very much a divide. And I think this is why he latched on to Jane. And the most interesting element of this whole book to me and the key to it all is adolescence and again when I was starting to write this story I thought to myself well what do I know quite a lot about and at the time I was a mother to four teenage boys I say at the time because two of them are now in their 20s but I knew a lot about teenage angst and adolescent issues because I'd lived through it all with my household And one of the most fascinating aspects of this whole story to me is that a teenager is a teenager, be it in 2023 or 1950 or 1900. You know, teenagers are a thing. It's it's a phase in your life where you cannot control your hormones. When you are sort of 16, which is about the age Sydney is when the story is written, he's actually 15, but he's the size of a man at this point, at 15 years old. And I remember one of my sons, who is now the tallest member of his household, being 15 and being the tallest member of my household. And I thought to myself, this is really interesting thing to write about because this child is the biggest of all of us. And yet emotionally, he can't cope and deal with that. He can't because he's 15 years old. And so to have the body of a man and I'm not going to say the mind of a child because that's not true, but there is a very much a point, and I would say it's between 16 and 18, when you are not a child and you are not an adult and you just don't know who you are because Sydney is physically quite big and so people will assume, he, he would have assumed authority. We do, we do that as a species, I think, if a man is tall, it's an assumed authority, isn't it? And he plays this very much to his advantage to get things he wants from staff or from Jane, in fact. But he doesn't know what's going on. He He's not in control of his emotions. There are a couple of times in the book where I talk about him nearly crying. And this was really important because somebody, a man of 40 wouldn't do that, but Sydney can't cope with his emotions. Things go wrong for him and he wants to cry. And that's a childish behavioural response, something that we, whether rightly or wrongly, we tend to sort of override that as we become adults. So this teenage element in the story was both fascinating and absolutely the driving force behind it. He falls, or he thinks he's fallen in love with somebody, but of course he hasn't, he doesn't know her. Nobody loves him. And then there's this pretty girl that he comes across and he imagines himself to be in love with her because that's what he he thinks he needs it's what he thinks he wants it's what he thinks will complete him or make him feel like an adult and the adolescence of Sydney and the immaturity and therefore the obsession that he has over Jane was absolutely the driving force between his his um, narrative in the book I thought it was really interesting how he falls for Phoebe 
you knew he wasn't in love with Jane, but I suppose it all kind of ties it up together for him effectively. Yeah, I, I think there was a danger. It might be unpalatable, possibly, for a reader. I was always aware mm. that Sydney had believed himself so passionately in love with Jane, and, and we know that he wasn't, and he, he knows that he wasn't. You know, he can accept that and stand back and see that. And then he does genuinely fall in love with her daughter. Now, that's something I did have to be very careful with because that can be a little bit of um, a delicate topic. But, I mean, there is no biology there. Mm. And I think the most important point was that he wasn't in love with her. It was just infatuation. He didn't know her. If you think about it, she's about apart from Mrs Murray, the only female in his life, he goes to an all-boys school. He's got a brother. He's got a father. Apart from staff, which would not really be on his radar, and that's why he found the whole thing with Jane so uncomfortable. It was a delicate path to tread, but one I'm happy with because he wasn't in love with Jane. That was not what that was about. That was about a teenage boy looking for someone, anyone to love him. And, I mean, I remember being a teenager and having, like, crushes on teachers that are wholly inappropriate but you're just wanting to be noticed and loved by somebody. And for Sydney, who's just had this awful childhood, I mean, really awful childhood. And as the book goes through, you can see Phoebe understanding why he's the man he is and why in many ways he sort of hasn't grown up. He still retains these kind of childish traits throughout the book because of his position, because he's the head of a household, because he can get away with it. And because he's got staff pandering to him, he almost is still childlike in in some ways. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you said about effectively getting the balance right. Because you're in Sydney's head, effectively, you do wonder if maybe he does love Jane, but then it becomes very clear very quickly that he isn't. But yes, I think it's interesting that you have Sydney, who obviously has issues trusting women because of what his dad has told him but then ultimately he does end up a good guy he gets it and then you've got Clement there it's it's a nice comparison he's not his father mm. and I think he breaks the cycle because unfortunately this is what happens in life that behavior can be kind of learned behavior from parents and quite often behavior cyclical in generations which is tragic and sometimes you just need something to break that that cycle but he he learned through his father, that women were not to be trusted. And he believed that because he had no influences to the contrary. And then when Phoebe comes along, he starts to unlearn that. Well, even with Jane, he starts to question, why has my dad been telling me all these things about women? Why is he saying women that so don't deserve our respect? When actually I can see that Jane is a kind and thoughtful person and I can see that she does deserve my respect look how she treats me look how she talks to me look we can have these conversations about poetry we can be equal he was such a great character to write and that that whole teenage mindset for his narrative I was just drawing so much real life experience for everything and a lot of the things you see him do I've witnessed a lot of his behavior his responses in not only my own children but also that peer group that I see around me a lot it was a real sort of study in teenagers. That selfishness, that arrogance, that belief that they're right in everything. I mean, he confronts Jane and tells her that she's in love with him because he cannot accept anything else. He knows it to be true and it's not. And he, he doesn't understand that. And teenagers have this kind of, I'm absolutely right and I know best. And I think adolescence is a time when all the dramas in your life are magnified and they are absolutely the worst thing. And if somebody dumps you, it's just the most horrific thing ever. You know, we've all been there. We've all had teenage diaries full of angst, haven't we? <laughs> it's been the absolute end of the world. But also as a teenager, I think there's moments of great joy. And I think you will never feel as passionate again about things as you do when you're a teenager. It's when you decide you're going to go to Trafalgar Square and march about something that you really, really believe in. I mean, that's not to say that we don't at other points in our life, but I think everything is so focused when you're a teenager, but everything is either absolutely phenomenally wonderful or you're in the absolute pit of despair. 
what is really interesting, of course, is the word teenager wasn't even around in, uh, <laughs> you know, 100 years ago. So I had to keep finding ways to say teenager without saying teenager. So the word adolescent was used a lot. Oh, fascinating. I mean, you saying what you're saying and everything, I'm thinking the advice is to write what you know, which you have done effectively four times. And I like that you brought up the word teenager because you had talked about that in another interview, which was absolutely fascinating because, I mean, just now here, the amount of times you're saying the word teenager. But then, of course, I suppose before that, before the time that your story takes place and hundreds of years before that, childhood wasn't a thing anyway. So it's interesting that we've got the words and when they come into play as such. And it's been very interesting as a writer now of historical fiction, the etymology of words is paramount I mean it's part of the reason it takes me so long to write the books because I do try so hard to check the etymology of all the words I use and it's amazing what I have learned is out of bounds for me so not only things like teenager but weekend the number of times I want to write weekend and I cannot write it really wasn't a thing until the end of the 20s I might even be later than that but a lot of words that you can't use and a lot of phrases that as an author absolutely sum up what I want to say and saying about the lack of anachronisms, because that was something I did very much appreciate about in your work. A few weeks ago, you were looking to see if you could find an alternative for OK, I believe it was. Did yeah. you find one? It's all right, I think, is the only thing that you can come up with. But it has been quite a challenge. So I put that on uh, TikTok because I thought that was a bit of fun. And I had quite a lot of engagement from that. And you take that out of the vocabulary. And even though I know this is really interesting, Charlie, even though I know I can't use that word, I will get to the end of the manuscript and put it in my find and replace and you can bet it slipped in there because it's such a part of our everyday speech and we use it without thinking. I think not using contractions is a mistake because I think it's very easy to think everybody spoke in a very formal way and I don't think that's true. But I think you do need to look at what words you're using and the structure of your sentences was different. It just makes the reader think, yeah, we're in this time period now. Absolutely. It really does make a difference. I think if you have anachronisms in a book, you notice. You really do. Oh, they leap out at you, don't they? Mm. Yeah. On that note, before we move on, I will say that Jenny's TikTok account is great. She's got tons of videos and the link to her TikTok account will be in the show notes. So go have a look. Was it important to have Hailsham Hall, the house, gained by Phoebe in some way? I think that's just the way the story led. It wasn't necessarily what, what I set out to do. Interestingly, when I was first talking about the ideas for this book, I had Phoebe coming to the hall very much as she presents at the beginning. So very much coming to the hall to find out about the estrangement between her uncle and her father and wanting to build bridges. And quite early on, my agent said, let's give her an edge. She needs more of an edge. Perhaps she isn't coming to build bridges after all. Perhaps she's got an ulterior motive. And I love that we present her as coming to find family and reconnect with family. And then quite quickly in the early chapters, we find out she's not there for that at all. She's there for revenge. And again, as soon as my agent said that to me, it's like, oh, that's so clever. (laughs) That's so brilliant. And I went away and thought about how I could make her have an edge and have an ulterior motive and develop that side of her character. So she does come to the hall in the beginning to reclaim it. She wants to solve the puzzle. She wants to snatch Halsham Hall away from the man that she believes had been so cruel to her own father. And the book is all the better for it without a shadow of a doubt. And I'm really thankful that I had that early conversation with my editor who said let's give her an edge because it's just brilliant and as you know from reading the book I love a bit of misdirection I want I want to present something and say this character is good and kind but actually then there's a twist there's a twist with Phoebe a lot of people get in touch with me or leave reviews with this book saying that that was what they enjoyed the most was that they thought it was going in one direction they thought they'd got things sussed they thought they knew what was going to happen And then I twisted it in another direction that they weren't expecting. I really liked how you've got this puzzle that is actually, although it's it's mainly solved, I suppose you could say, you leave the last clue to the end. I love that. 
I think I, I would leave it, maybe leave it up to you to talk about why you did that, because it really just gives the novel an end point that makes a point in itself about what's happened before. I just enjoyed that so much. It, it was the whole thing that, for anybody that hadn't read the book, there's a series of riddles that both Phoebe works through in the 1920s timeline and Sydney works through when he's an adolescent. And you think that they solved it. They go up the stairs, they turn the key in the lock of this door that haunted most of Sydney's childhood. And obviously Phoebe's only on the scene a relatively short space of time, but she's curious about this. Her father's referred to this door. Their whole childhood, this door is at the top of the stairs that lead nowhere. They lead to this locked door. And incidentally, I didn't name the title of this book. My publisher did. All the time I was writing this book, it was called The Staircase That Led Nowhere. That was its title for the whole time that I was writing it. So you can see how pivotal the the staircase was. And I love the idea that they finally solve all of these riddles, turn the key, open the door, and there is absolutely nothing there. That is just like, (laughs) what a great twist. (laughs) What's behind this door? For 30 years, people are wondering... And there's nothing behind the door. It's a brick wall. And and in fact, it's an exterior wall. So there is literally nothing behind it. There's a lot of things coming together in this book. And I think probably that was the most complicated part of the whole book was I did get to a point where I did have to plan. And the planning was, in what order do I tie up these things? It was a real pen and paper job where I had to think to myself, well, I have to solve these five things or however many things it was. And then just to have the joy of suddenly realising that the puzzle hadn't been solved and that there was more to it and there was actually what appeared to just be a label around the key was actually the final clue. That was such a joy. I smiled to myself and felt quite smug with myself that I had this last ace up my sleeve. I love how you kept giving the answers to all the questions that I know I had as a reader. And I really did like how you ended it with Sylvia. I remember thinking, okay, we've got Sylvia as well. This is going to happen at some point. And that you did let her live effectively and she was she was there. I, I think that was possibly my favourite of them just because, you know, you've been waiting for so long and wondering and hoping. So you said to me in our emails, you haven't lived an exciting life. You're an ordinary mum of four boys and we've been introduced to them earlier. How has your life affected what and how you write, if I may ask? I think not leading an exciting life in terms of, I couldn't say I've travelled the world and I've had a job that's been extraordinary. No, I've I've worked on film sets or, or I've been a journalist or there are so many rich careers and lifestyles that can add to your writing if you are lucky enough to have led those. But I think the core of writing is emotions. And I think everybody lives through those because everybody will see somebody that they know and love die. That happens. You know, most of us will fall passionately in love with somebody at some point in our life. We might be bullied at school. We have very close relationships. And so, yeah, I think being a mum, and you don't have to be a mum to write a book about children, but... I think being a mum has opened me up to a lot of emotions and enabled me to be empathetic in a lot of situations, definitely. I really believe that living a life, and it doesn't matter the scale of the life, that's the key. I have a queer character in the book coming up shortly, and it wasn't my lived experience, but oh my goodness, did I do the research and talk to the right people and had sensitivity readers and made sure that that voice was authentic because that's important. Tell us more about this next book. So my next book, which I can't tell you the title because we don't have one, (laughs) is out in October and it is set in 1927. It's an historical sliding doors. And we are looking at Agnes Humphreys, who has a beautiful Georgian London home but has been forced to rent the rooms because she needs the money and she narrows it down to three applicants and the story splits into three to look at the consequences of her taking each of these three lodgers in and how the story turns out very very differently if she took each of these three in and that I loved writing that so much 
fantastic. Sliding Doors is actually one of my favourite movies, so yeah, bring it on, definitely. Jenny, it has been lovely having you today. You have answered so many things that I, that I didn't even know to question in a way. There's just so much going on that has been fascinating to hear about. Thank you for being here today. It's been my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for letting me talk about Helsham Hall. It's been an utter delight. Thank you. And thank you very much for listening. Please do share this episode with anyone you think would be interested in it. The Wormhole Podcast, episode 77, was recorded on the 23rd of May and published on the 26th of June, 2023. Music and production by Charlie Place.